Hi guys, this is your um, extra kind of lecture over stress and um, the healthy lifestyle approach chapters. Um, I just decided I'm going to put it all in one. So you have a fill in for um, chapter seven stress, but then you also have a fill in for the chapter eight healthy lifestyle approach. I'm just going to give you all of those right now in the same video to make your life a little bit easier. So we're going to start with the chapter seven stress fill in that is linked um, by the video in your module. And so basically the first blank, the general physical and emotional state that accompanies the stress response is stress. And then any physical or psychological event or condition that produces those reactions is called a stressor. Um, you have your autonomic nervous system. Remember auto, if you put something on autopilot, it goes by itself. So your autonomic system is what goes by itself. Things you don't have to think about. Breathing, heart rate, all of that. It is broken into two sections. Your first is your parasympathetic, which is going to kind of slow everything down. It moderates the excited effect. Um, that's P-A-R-A-S-Y-M-P-A-T-H. E-T-I-C, if you need help spelling it. And um, the other is just the sympathetic, and that is what's going to accelerate everything so that you're ready for fight or flight, okay? Um, if you see norepinephrine, that term is given to you, but um, it's important that you know it is not only gonna cause arousal, but it is gonna increase attention, awareness, and alertness. Under your endocrine system, which is what kind of puts all the hormones into your bloodstream, you've got a chemical messenger produced in the body. It's called a hormone. Okay. There's a specific steroid hormone that is secreted by the outer layer of the adrenal gland, and that is called cortisol. That's related to stress. It's also related to hunger. Um, a hormone secreted by the inner core is called epinephrine, E P. I-N-E-P-H-R-I-N-E. -E. And that is the same thing that we call adrenaline. Okay, lastly in that section, you have brain secretions that have pain inhibiting effects and those are called endorphins. Uh, you've got your fight or flight, which like I said earlier, that is our natural reaction. It automatically happens whether it's a big stressor or a little stressor. So it could be you um, are running late to work. It could be somebody cut you off in traffic up to it could be somebody's chasing you with a gun. Our body is gonna physically respond the same and that's called fight or flight. Two factors that can reduce the how the stress response affects us is successful prediction. So us being able to predict that those things are gonna happen and prepare for them and perception of control. Um, basically our analysis of do we have control over those events. Um, your somatic nervous system is the opposite of your autonomic. So those are the things we think about. So moving our muscles, um, things like that. And then the sum of behavioral, cognitive, and emotional tendencies are our personality. And underneath there, you have four types of personality. And I just want to point out that type A is typically the one that is linked to higher risk of heart attack and more stress because they have that ambitious, competitive, aggressive sometimes anger or drive in them. If you flip it over, two personality traits that enable people to better handle stress are going to be what we call hardiness and resilience. And men or women report a higher level of stress than men. Okay. And then you've got some charts that I went ahead and gave you, so I'm not going to read through those. Um, allostatic load basically is that negative impact after we experience stress for a long time. And so that can relate to things like heart disease, obesity, um, reduced brain function, reduced immune function. Um, so we know that increased levels of stress hormones are linked to decrease in the number and functioning of our immune cells, which is why people get sick when they're constantly stressed out. Um, it lists a whole bunch of health problems that you guys can read, common sources of stress, and then just some little tidbits. So people who exercise regularly are going to deal with stress better. A healthy, balanced diet can help cope with stress. And unfortunately, part of that is you actually want to limit or avoid caffeine, um, which is sad because that's how a lot of people cope with, um, if they're stressed and they're not sleeping very well, they're gonna cope with that by drinking caffeine, which is not the best um, response. 
Most adults are going to need seven to nine hours of sleep every night. And what we found is that this has the greatest impact on stress. And unfortunately, that's one of the first things to go typically when people are stressed out um, is their amount of sleep. Okay. Um, we know extreme sleep deprivation can lead to hallucinations. As many as 50% of adults are going to suffer from one symptom of insomnia. And about 70 million Americans suffer from chronic sleep disorders. Uh, you can manage stress with good communication in relationships. And then something else that's important is spiritual wellness is actually associated with greater coping skills. Um, and then it lists a bunch of other information there. Make sure you know that counterproductive coping mechanisms, so things that are not a good way to cope, which a lot of people rely on, are going to be things like alcohol, tobacco, drugs, caffeine, um, overeating, uh, gambling, spending money, any of those. And last but not least, a mood disorder characterized by loss of interest, sadness, hopelessness, etc., is called depression. Okay, so that's all for that section that you're going to do in the fill-ins. And then we're going to move on to the um, healthy lifestyle approach, which includes, I just picked out some specific notes on cardiovascular health and cancer. So um, for cardiovascular health, uh, the first one is going to be cardiovascular disease, which is basically what we call all of those issues, and it is the leading cause of death in the U.S., largely due to our way of life. So things like um, not exercising enough, eating, um, overeating, eating unhealthy. Okay, under tobacco, we know that pack-a-day smokers are, two, are at two times the risk of a heart attack, and if you smoke more than two packs a day, you're at three times the risk. Heart attack victims are two to three times more likely to die if they smoke. Um, and then it kind of discusses some of the different things that smoking can do, which you guys can read through. Um, know that the official term for high blood pressure is hypertension. Okay. Um, the form of CVD is arteriosclerosis, which I actually made a, a error on the printout if you print it out. Uh, if you look down like two lines, you can that shows you how to spell arteriosclerosis. That should be up in that blank. Okay. Um, instead of the bold arteriosclerosis that I put, it should say lipoproteins. And then LDL is going to be your bad cholesterol, and HDL is going to be your good cholesterol. Um, for every five unit increment in your BMI. That risk of coronary heart disease goes up by 30%. Um, it talks a little bit about diabetes, high triglyceride levels, and basically what we want to try to do is favor unsaturated fats over saturated fats. Um, in the psychological factors, just know that acute episodes um, of mental stress are what can affect our um, cardiovascular system. And then I bolded some things like anger, anxiety, and depression. Uh, alcohol and drugs. Drinking too much alcohol raises blood pressure and can increase risk of stroke and heart failure. And stimulant drugs can also cause serious cardiac problems because they speed everything up. So your body might not be able to handle that. Um, some things that we can't change, risk factors. Aging. 70% of heart attack victims are over 65 um, men are more likely to have cardiovascular earlier in life. Estrogen production may offer premenopausal women some protection, but by 85, that goes away. Ethnicity. African Americans have much higher rates of hypertension, heart disease, and stroke. And Asian Americans typically have the lower rates of cardiovascular disease. Um, if you flip at that page over, the deposit of fatty substances is called plaque. E-L-A-Q-U-E. And heart disease caused by arteriosclerosis is coronary heart disease, or you can just put CHD. A heart attack is going to be damage to the heart muscle. Um, and then there's a bunch of terms listed for you. I'm just going to let you guys read through those. Um, treatments are going to include reducing workload, lowering salt intake, and taking drugs to eliminate fluids. And then under protecting yourself, you're going to see uh, we want to reduce sodium intake, increase potassium intake, moderate alcohol or moderate alcohol can increase our good age or our good 
um, HDL, but excessive alcohol can lead to some serious problems. We want to exercise regularly, as we've mentioned before. We want to avoid tobacco. Smoking is the number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, know and manage your blood pressure. Uh, if you don't have any risk factors, you want to take that once every two years. Um, manage your cholesterol. People 20 and over should have cholesterol checked once every five years. Develop ways to handle stress and anger. Okay, so that's all for cardiovascular disease. And then let's talk about cancer a little bit. So on the cancer page, obviously the abnormal uncontrolled uh, multiplication of cells is called cancer. It is responsible for one out of four deaths in the U.S. each year, and it is the second leading cause of death after heart disease. Um, a mass of tissue that serves no physiological purpose is called a tumor. And then it gives you the different kinds. Um, a few cancers, like leukemia, do not produce a mass. So you have to do a blood test um, to figure those out. It's not something that you would find in a scan of your body. Um, to control cancer, every cancer cell must be removed, which is why it's difficult sometimes. Genetic factors. DNA is what carries our genetic information. Chromosomes, most humans have 23 pairs. Um, gene is the section of chromosome that has the instruction. And any change in the makeup of a gene is called a mutation. Okay. Um, again, we go back to the environment and lifestyle stuff. Tobacco. Smoking is responsible for up to 90% of lung cancers and about 29% of all cancer deaths total. It is responsible for nearly one in five American deaths each year. Dietary factors. Diets high in fat and meat might contribute to colon, prostate, and stomach cancer. Um, talks a little about omega-6. Um, next, alcohol. Alcohol is associated with several cancers, and if you combine it with tobacco, there's a risk factor for oral cancer. Um, foods cooked at high temperatures are an issue because they have carcinogens in it. Um, underneath carcinogen, fiber. Experts want a high fiber diet, and then it gives you kind of some more key points that you guys can get through. On the back, less than 2% of cancer deaths are caused by environmental pollution. What's more an issue is exposure to carcinogenic materials in the workplace. Um, that next blank is going to be radiation, which all sources are potentially carcinogenic, which is why we try not to have too many x-rays unless we need them. And for microbes, about 15 to 20 of the world's cancers are caused by these. And an example would be something like HPV. Lung cancer most common cause of cancer death in the U.S., about 158,000 deaths a year. And then it gives you some of the symptoms. And then as regard, in regards to treatment, 15% alive after five years. So it doesn't have an extremely high um, success rate. Colon and rectal cancer, 90% of cases are diagnosed in people age 50 or older. And then a little bit down below, exams should be performed yearly after you turn 50. Breast cancer, most common cancer in women, and is second to lung cancer in the number of deaths among women. Uh, risk factors, increased estrogen exposure can be an issue, which is why sometimes birth control um, is a problem. And those risks can be increased by alcohol. Prostate cancer, most common cancer in men, and second leading cause of cancer death in men. Age is the strongest predictor. 97% of cases occurring in men over age 50. And then this one, thankfully, the five-year survival rate is almost 100%. Cervical cancer, most of these come from HPV. Uterine and endometrial cancer. Um, mostly after the age of 55. Ovarian cancer, unfortunately rare, but this one is one that we don't, it's a lot of deaths happen from this. So it's rare compared to uterine, but more deadly. Skin cancer, most common cancer. Um, you've got the deep layers are called basal, B-A-S-A-L. 
And the surface layers are called squamous, which is S-Q-U-A-M-O-U-S. And together, that's 95% of all skin cancers. Melanoma is the most dangerous because it spreads very rapidly. For head and neck cancers, um, it is two times as common in men, most frequently in men over 40. For testicular, that is the most common cancer among males who are aged 20 to 35. Pancreatic cancer, no cure for this one, and kills 49,000 Americans annually. Bladder cancer, men are four times more likely, and smoking is a huge risk factor. Kidney cancer usually occurs at the age, over the age of 50. Brain cancer, ionizing radiation seems to be a huge factor. And leukemia is the cancer of the white blood cells. And lymphoma begins in your lymph nodes. Okay, so that gives you all of your fill-ins. Um, again, the links to both of those are right next to the video. So you print those off first and then watch the video and you'll be able to fill them in. Um, hopefully you already did that. I don't know why I'm saying that at the end of the video. But um, so then your test will be over these two fill-ins and your two PowerPoints just like normal. It will open Friday morning and you'll have till Sunday night just like normal. So if you have any questions, let me know.